You're listening to Paris Search UK Radio. News, views and reviews from the world of the paranormal from across the UK and beyond. Find us on Facebook, Twitter and the World Wide Web. Paris Search UK Radio. The views and opinions expressed by presenters and guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Parasearch UK Radio or its affiliates and sponsors. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to the KTPF Reload Show. In case you're wondering what the Reload Show is about, if you haven't heard previous shows, these are the interviews that were conducted by good friends of mine, Stephen and Sue Taggart, in the days of the KTPF Radio Show. Their own radio show ran for just over four years, broadcasting every week for over three hours a night. I joined them in the last 18 months of the show's run, but eventually the guys felt they'd just about had enough. It was a monumental effort to keep broadcasting every week for three hours. It was a wonderful show. But unfortunately, they're no longer involved, and the shows have just sort of sat in the archives, so I thought it would be nice to bring them back to life and bring you the interviews that the guys conducted over those four years. They include some of the most interesting people within the world of the paranormal and some not so well known, but still, nevertheless still very interesting. We even have one or two rather unusual shows including a live seance and um, other things along those lines. Anyway, hopefully you enjoy tonight's show. And this is the KTPF Reload Show. Enjoy. This program deals with themes of an adult nature and is intended for a mature audience. Yeah, good evening everyone and welcome to the KTPF Community Talk Show. My name is Suzanne. And I'm Steve. And we're here keeping the paranormal friendly. And for those who are new to the KTPF, Steve and I started the site back in 2007 and our mission was to try and bring the paranormal world together. In 2012 we decided to have a chat room with a difference in inviting you to engage in a live friendly discussion and just to let you know who's on tonight we've got Lionel Fanthorpe returning a writer, tutor and motorcycling Anglican priest um, Lionel started as a journalist in Chroma then 10 years as a headmaster principal of, the bi- of a big comprehensive high school in Cardiff as well as being a fully ordained Anglican priest he has lectured on the paranormal, ghosts, UFOs, mysteries of life and death, Masons, Templars, Bible mysteries and so much more. And tonight we're talking about death, the final mystery. I'm hoping everyone can hear you okay. Um, nice to have you back on the show again. It's a great pleasure to be back on the show. Now Lionel, um, you're a man of mystery. You've been uh, del- delving in mystery for quite some years now. Um, yeah, 50 years and more. 50 years. Where do you find the time, I tell you? <laughs> well, for a long time, it was my living. <laughs> really? Yeah, when I was doing those uh, big series called 14 TV, yeah. you know, which was um, based on the name of Charles Ford, who was the great American investigator in the 20s and 30s. Mm-hmm. And uh, so just like Dickensian is to do with Dickens, Shakespearean to do with Shakespeare, so 14 means following in the footsteps of Charles Ford. And we had uh, three or four series of those and went all over the world doing them and tremendous things. Really, really, really enjoyed it. What made you get into all this, though, Lionel? Well, well, it started when uh, I was a very reluctant schoolboy. I couldn't wait to be 15 and leave, as you could in those days. Mm. I absolutely hated school. And I I think of some of the poor teachers who had to put up with me as a difficult and recalcitrant student. (laughs) Um, And uh, if they could have then seen me a few years later as headmaster of a big comprehensive school, I think they'd have looked at each other and said, not him, never in a thousand years. (laughs) (laughs) It happens, life is strange. Uh, Anyway, I I didn't like school. Mm. And... uh, I used to sneak away into the library, and there, it was a very old-fashioned library, with those tall shelves all the way down, 
not much more than six feet apart, you know, and then all the way up to the ceiling. Yeah. And uh, there were maybe a dozen of those. And if you positioned yourself in the right place and kept absolutely quiet, then the teacher on library duty wouldn't know that there was a, a naughty student in there who should have been somewhere else <laughs> doing, doing Latin or algebra. Mm -hmm. And uh, while I was exploring the library, mm -hmm. uh, I found stories of H.G. Wells, stories of Edgar Allan Poe, and uh, any other books of fictional mysteries, yeah. which intrigued me. And then sometime around age 16, 17, when I was left school, I couldn't help thinking, I, as I remembered back on those books that I'd enjoyed reading so much in the library, mm. I, I thought, well, I wonder if it is only fiction or if there are really strange unsolved mysteries out there. Yeah. And that set me exploring and you know, through the uh, publicity available through the Society for Psychical Research, various other groups. Mm. Uh, if there was a, a haunted, I would just watch your local paper to see that uh, someone had reported to the paper or um, had got the story out in some other way to say that this particular old farmhouse was haunted or that um, this uh, old rectory was haunted or the old castle was haunted. And as I would then go and examine them, I would interview the people who said they'd seen something there. And that, it really went from an interest in fiction that dealt with the barren to an exploration yeah. of the factual paranormal. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when I met my Patricia and uh, we got married way back in 1957, so we just celebrated our 57th anniversary. And uh, Pat was as interested in the uh, paranormal as I was. And when you've got a loving partner who helps and encourages you, with your interests, um, so it just seems to multiply. Yeah, and uh, so that was how it all began, and how it yeah, how it still goes on. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've got a question for you straight away in the in the uh, chat room. Uh, Andy would like to know how on earth does Lionel go from ghost to to the priesthood? Ah, yes, <laughs> that's a very very interesting question, and it's the uh, one I will do my best to answer. Uh, it's fundamentally that I think uh, that the God of Truth, whom I worship and whom I believe in, mm. is a God of facts and God of evidence. And so when I go looking for the paranormal, going to exploring anything that is um, unnatural or supernatural, then for me it is no more and no less than if I'm teaching chemistry and I mix two or three substances on the bench to demonstrate that to the students. And then whether I'm experimenting with chemistry, whether I'm experimenting with uh, something to do, shall we say, with sound waves or high yeah. frequencies in physics, then the evidence that you obtain in a scientific environment is neither more nor less than the evidence that you can attempt to obtain in um, a, an environment which is said to be paranormal. So it's my love of and my desire to satisfy my curiosity that makes it possible contradiction between the two. Yeah. Whether it's scientific investigation or whether it is an investigation of phenomenon which some other friends may have thought of as paranormal. I'm a million, um, I'm a million light years away from the idea that any paranormal event is somehow evil or straight or of the devil. Um, I think it's just part of the universe, yeah. and it's uh, up to us. So I, I don't find any incompatibility at all between being a Christian priest 
uh, and exploring a room which is allegedly haunted. Mm, mm. Have you ever found anything? Because um, as a paranormal investigator, we, we go to places quite a lot, and, and some places are quite quiet and, and maybe not as haunted as people think. Is there anywhere that you can really say well, have, have been really haunted for you? Well, if I could tell you the single strangest thing happened to me, I had a very great friend. When I was teaching in Cambridge, had a very great friend called Billy Farrow. This is Bill and I were young teachers together mm. back in the 50s and early 60s. And uh, we were like brothers. We, you, know, you just meet people like this, and uh, you feel that they're as close as family. And Bill and I were like that. He was just terrific. And, um, Pat and I were aunt and uncle to his kids, <laughs> although there was no biological connection with his family, and he and his wife were aunt and uncle to our two kids, mm -hmm. and uh, it was that kind of friendship, you know, yeah. I just used that as an illustration of how close Bill and I were. Yeah. Then, after I had come to Cardiff, many years after Bill and I had worked together in Cambridge, um, he phoned me to ask if I could go over to see him in Cambridge, because he'd just been diagnosed with something terminal. And I said, yeah, of course I will, Bill. I'll get over as often as I can. And for the last three months of his life, I got over to visit him as often as I could. Mm. Then I got a phone call from his village priest, Father Ian, just outside Cambridge, saying, ever so sorry to tell you that your friend Bill has just passed over and uh, that he had left a request for me to conduct his funeral. So... We fixed it up together, Father Ian and myself, and we were going to do the service in Ian's church, and uh, then we were going to lay Bill to rest in a, a beautiful little plot very close to the church door. Mm. And uh, anyhow, I got over there the night before the service so that Ian and I could arrange the service together. And suddenly, while we imagine two priests with the prayer books, I say, well, if I read that bit, you do the one on page 17, and then I'll do the next piece. But suddenly, in the middle of that planning, I saw Bill. Really? He didn't look in the least supernatural. No. He looked as he had looked when we were young teachers together. All trace of the illness had vanished. He looked like a young man in his prime and radiantly happy, great big smile. And then he gave me a message. He said, with a smile, just tell Ian, the other priest, just tell Ian that Juliana of Norwich was absolutely right. And then he vanished. Mm. And the vanishing, it was just as if somebody had entered a room yeah. and then wasn't there. It, it wasn't anything ethereal or spectral. He was as solid and as real as he had been in life. He looked just like um, a, a fit, happy young man, 20s or 30s, and then came and went as though by magic. Now, Ian, the other priest, had not seen or heard anything. I turned to him and I said, Ian, I know this is going to sound very strange, but I've just seen Bill. He looked radiantly happy. And he asked me to give you a message. He asked me to tell you that Juliana of Norwich was absolutely right. Now, I'd expected that Ian would maybe just shrug his shoulders and say, well, sorry, old man, I, I don't know anything. That doesn't mean anything, but he didn't. He went backwards as if he'd been hit with an electric shock or a water cannon mm -hmm. and took a deep breath. When he got himself under control again, he said, you can't have known that. Now, I'm all a dog. What can't I have known? What is all this about? Yeah. Why is Ian so shocked? And when he got himself back under control, he explained. He said that he had been with Bill in intensive care ward at the hospital in Cambridge, just as Bill was about to slip away. And he said, the last thing I said to him 
was to tell him about Lady Juliana, or Saint Juliana, of Norwich, 14th century holy woman. And Juliana had had a vision of heaven. The other nuns who were clustered around her did not realize that she was experiencing a thing. They thought that she was ill. Her eyes had gone blank. And they thought she was ill and was about to fall. And so her sisters in the order had clustered round her so that she couldn't fall and hurt herself. And then she recovered. Mm. And she said, no, I'm not, I'm not ill. She said, I have just seen heaven. Yeah. She said, my spirit left my body and I've seen heaven. And then, of course, all the other girls would automatically ask, what is it like? And all that Juliana could say in an ecstasy of happiness was, all shall be well, all shall be well, all manner of things shall be well. Mm. And Ian said to me, he said, you've just driven 300, 300 miles to tell me that Bill is safe in the next world and that he said he's obviously ecstatically happy. Yeah. And he said, just tell Ian, Juliana was absolutely right that mm -hmm. heaven is a place of indescribable happiness. Well, if you could imagine two priests sitting there looking as if we just qualified for Madame to sword, mm. and then Ian finally said, I think I'll open a bottle of wine before we do any more. <laughs> <laughs> So before we go into that sort of subject, uh, Andy would like to know also, um, what came first, school head or vicar, or the other way around? Oh, uh, yeah, I, well, I can explain that they, they interlock in a very interesting way. Right. Um, I came to Cardiff in 1970s as headmaster of uh, Glinderu High School in a suburb of Cardiff called Ely, and I was there uh, right until the end of the 80s, 11 or 12 years. I hadn't been there very long when one of our boys in the school was killed in a terrible accident. Mm. The didn't happen in school, but he'd gone to help his brother, who was the manager of a food warehouse. I did. And the young man, whose name was Peter James, was riding on a forklift truck in his brother's warehouse. And the driver forgot that he had a man on the top. And he went under a doorway and Peter was crushed to death. Mm -hmm. Well, as his headmaster, you know, your students are your friends. Mm. And I had to go around to see the family. And our own two daughters were then teenagers. and. As a, a loving parent of youngsters of the same age as the boy who'd been killed, you know, you feel so much sympathy for the family. And I went round to see them and uh, did my best to share with them my absolute certainty that our time on earth is only the beginning of mm. an eternal life with God in heaven. And I said I was absolutely the young Peter again in God's good time when they left the earth. And as I was leaving the house, Peter's elder sister, his married sister, came to the door with me and said, Headmaster, I don't know quite what you have said, my mother, but she has come out of shock. He'd been in shock since Peter's death. And this young lady said, you've just done her so much good the way that you told her you were certain about life after death and that she would see Peter again. He said she's come out of shock and she's on the way to recovery. And I said to Pete's sister, if I have done that or if I've contributed to that, it is the most important thing I have ever done in my life. And that set me thinking that if I took up the calling of a priest, yeah. I would be
be seeing a lot more bereaved families mm. and that I would be able to do my best to help and to comfort them. And this is probably something that I do three or four times a month that I asked if I will go and see a bereaved family and conduct the service for them. And I do. And I find it's, um, well, if you can bring a little comfort to somebody who's going through the worst experience of their lives, yeah. then you are doing something very worthwhile. So I was a headmaster long before I was a priest, and uh, it was the death of that young man and my attempt as a headmaster, as a, a lay Christian, to uh, help him and his family, to help his family, uh, that um, was in a sense my sort of inner directive to change my profession and to uh, become a priest. Right, okay. Now during your time of writing, you've written loads and loads of pieces and books um, from numerology through to the Masons, uh, Voodoo, even uh, time yeah. walks um, about the Holy Grail, and also the um, uh, the Ren René Le Chateau. Yeah, the Ren Le Chateau mystery. That's one that's fascinated me, perhaps among all the hundreds of mysteries that Patricia and I have investigated. Really, the Ren Le Chateau I would put pretty high on the list. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So um, it, the, the the book we want to talk about tonight is um, the death. The final mystery. Yes, of now, course. That was, you know, I couldn't believe until I just double checked it, knowing mm -hmm. that you were going to ask me about it. Uh, that came out in the year 2000, 15 years ago. Really? And it doesn't seem that long. <laughs> <laughs> what made you decide to write this sort of book? Right. Well, uh, we write 90% um, of our mystery books mm. for a company called Dundurn who are Canadian publishers, based in Toronto. And from time to time, they are kind enough to honour us with a commission mm -hmm. and to do another book for them. And uh, then we think of a dozen things that we'd like to do, a dozen topics that interest us. I mean, we've done one on the world's greatest unsolved mysteries. We've done one of the ones that you mentioned. Um, done another one on the world's most mysterious places, mm -hmm. world's most mysterious people. And so we send in a list, and then they pick the one that they like. And uh, they thought that on this occasion, they would like to look at something on the lines of death, the final mystery. And uh, so we broke that down for them into a series of chapters and suggestions, and they came back and said, yes, please, go ahead and write it. So that was how that one came to be done. Yeah. And they're... Uh, what really amazes us is before I started working for Dundurns, and Patricia and I write, we, we co-write everything together, and we do the uh, the factual mysteries or the serious philosophical and theological mysteries. Before that, I used to write science fiction for a company called Badger Books. Mm -hmm. And when Badger Books finally ceased to be publishers, uh, we got all our rights back, and we recently had contact with Orion, the very big uh, publishers, yeah. uh, who do all their stuff up on uh, Kindle, and uh, they asked whether they could, uh, I'd written round figures, about 150 of these science fiction, fantasy, and supernatural stories, mm -hmm. all badger books. Yeah. And then uh, they are now just coming up again after <laughs> when I think it was 63 years ago when I was 17 mm. that I wrote the first one and they're all they're all up over you know, 100 and, I don't know, 140 150 of my old titles mm. from the 50s and 60s it does look amazing and I think well wow um, to think they've been lying there dormant since Badger books ceased publishing, and now here's this this huge Orion group who are you know an extremely um, excellent company, a leading publisher, and they've uh, they've just got all my stuff up again on the uh, uh, you know as Kindle. Well, 
where does technology take us? Oh, and this is it. It adds to the longevity of it, doesn't it? Really? It certainly does. And uh, yeah. no, I'm very, very happy that Orion wanted them. And I, I just sent another load off to them um, just a few days ago. So those will all be popping up mm. as as Kindles very shortly. Now, going back to your book, um, Death the Final Mystery. Oh, Death the Final Mystery, yes. Yeah. Um, how did you approach the investigation side of it? Right, well, what I looked into first was the the nature of evidence. And as I said earlier this evening when you and I were talking, uh, what fascinates me is evidence. I want facts mm. as far as we can get them. So I did a chapter on the uh, the nature of evidence and the importance of evidence. And what I just need to add to that is that when we lived in East Anglia, um, before coming over to Cardiff in the 1970s, mm -hmm. uh, I was one of the Cambridge University lecturers uh, doing a course for the Extra Mural Board at Cambridge on the psychology and sociology of unexplained mysteries. Yeah. And just to give a quick example of that, taking the idea of the Mary Celeste, which is a, you know, a classic unsolved mystery, what happened to the captain and his family and the crew. Mm. And why, and this is where the psychology and sociology become prominent, why of all the nautical mysteries was that one so appealing? Why did that get such a, such a grip on public uh, interest? And the, the the mystery was partly solved because the, uh, the, the very famous Sherlock Holmes author uh, had also written for the Strand magazine. And he wrote a story in which a ship like the Mary Celeste was found perfectly seaworthy, but no body on Award. Now, in the fiction, with Conan Doyle's short story in the magazine, in the fictional version, the lifeboat was intact on the ship, so the people had not gone in the lifeboat. And that's what made it such a mystery, mm. fictional version. Mm. In actual fact, when Patricia and I went over to Gibraltar and examined all the documentation about the Mary Celeste, we found that the lifeboat had gone. So that in the fictional version, the lifeboat was intact and on board, so the people had not gone in the boat. In the real life, the factual version, the lifeboat was missing. So the captain and crew had gone in the lifeboat. Yeah. And it had obviously sunk and drowned them all. Mm. And the Mary Celeste had just chugged her or just, uh, you know, drifted along on her own until she was uh, salvaged by the crew of the Dia Gratia, which came first. So that when we're looking into the importance of evidence, we get hold of something like that and we say, why? What was the psychology and sociology? So I start off uh, in the book with the importance, the psychological and sociological importance of evidence. Mm. Now, there's another story that's uh, actually in Death, the Final Mystery, of Judge Hornby, who was working out in the Far East in the days of the Victorian uh, Empire, spread of you know, the old British Empire as was in the end of the 19th century. And Hornby told a story of how the uh, a journalist friend had come to see him in the early hours of the morning and had asked him for his ruling given during the day on a particular case, as he, the journalist, wanted to include that binding in the next day's paper. And Judge Hornby, absolutely certain that he'd spoken to the, to the journalist, and uh, said that he had given him the judgment, and uh, 
been rather annoyed with him for calling so late and disturbing him. And a few years afterwards, when Hornby was telling this story, some psychic investigators who were absolutely um, evidence-based discovered that what Hornby had told them about the visiting journalist, the guy had been dead during the night at the time when Judge Hornby thought he was talking to him. So it sounded as though Hornby was saying that he'd spoken to the ghost of the journalist. And he had also said in the course of that story that he had been so disturbed by the arrival of the journalist in the very late evening, early hours of the morning, that he had discussed the whole thing with Lady Hornby, his wife. When the later investigations took place, it transpired that Judge Hornby wasn't married at that time. The first Lady Hornby had died a couple of years before, and he did not remarry until some long time after this episode with the apparent ghost of the journalist. Mm. And the poor old judge, who you imagine is a man in a, a legal position, in a very important and responsible position, said that if he had not believed the story to be absolutely true and factual, he would never have repeated it. So that here you have a witness who is a, a solemn, a thoughtful, a highly educated, intelligent man with a great sense of the importance of the truth, making what seems to be a profound mistake. So in the chapter that deals with the importance of evidence, I recount that episode. Yeah. And the next thing we go into in the book is the nature of personality. What is it in you, in me, in our listeners? What is it which is the real person? What we might call the psyche or the soul or the spirit, the character. What exactly is it that makes up you or me or the billions of human beings who are sharing this planet with us? What am I? And then, in the course of that chapter, I also refer to, while discussing the nature of personality, the idea of group personalities and group minds. And I look at the work that James Lovelock did on his Gaia hypothesis, in which he suggests that all living things in the, the life sphere of the Earth form one gigantic being whom he calls Gaia. So we are all, as it were, the components of Gaia, the, the great Earth Mother. That's the, you know, the Lovelock Gaia hypothesis. So to what extent are we really, truly individuals? And to what extent are we components of something bigger? In the next chapter, we look at the five most likely explanations for honest reports of paranormal entities. The first is that it is what we might call a Shakespearean or Dickensian ghost, like uh, dear old Silas Marley in Scrooge, or mm -hmm. the ghost of Hamlet's father in Shakespeare. And this is a disembodied human spirit that has lived on Earth and whose physical body has died, but who continues in the spirit world. Then, another hypothesis which the uh, avant-garde physicists tend to put forward is about the, well, the, the happiest phrase for it that uh, I can always remember is the worlds of if. And if we think about all the activities, all the decisions, all the things that we do, for example, like uh, you're arranging uh, for me to come on your program again, 
yeah. this evening, and that I am at home and that I'm well and that I'm able to do the show with you, thoroughly enjoying it, that um, let's suppose that either you or I had been called away and couldn't do it. Mm-hmm. Now, let's imagine, as the avant-garde physicist imagined, that the world that didn't happen, the chance that never took place, does exist in a parallel universe, which they call one of the worlds of if. And just occasionally, so it is suggested, these parallel universes, the what might have been as well as the what has been, come so close together that one impinges on the other and we can actually see what's happening there. A classic example is when somebody thinks that he or she has seen their double, or what the Germans call a doppelganger. There's a wonderful account of a young British school teacher in the 19th century working in one of those famous Swiss finishing schools. Um, Very pleasant, happy young lady, enjoyed her teaching, uh, popular with staff colleagues, and very popular with her students. And then one day, while she was writing on the board, she suddenly realized that nobody in the class was paying any attention, which was so unusual because she normally had a wonderful relationship with her classes. Mm. They were all staring out of the window and looking shocked. So she went across to the window and saw herself walking in the school garden. And that kind of doppelganger experience is what the scientists, the physicists who put forward the idea of the world of if suggest. But in one probability track, the head of the school had given her two free periods on a Tuesday afternoon, and on the other probability track, they were teaching periods. <laughs> and the two probability tracks had run together, and so on the one where she wasn't teaching, she was walking in the garden. Yeah. The one where she was teaching, she was teaching, but both tracks were perceived by the kids in the classroom. Now, that's a fascinating idea about these parallel universes. A third thing is the idea of extraterrestrials, that uh, some apparently psychic phenomena might be caused by a visitor from out of space who has got a technology that's so far ahead of ours that uh, they can do things that would seem magical or paranormal to us. Then one of the old favorites that's used particularly to explain um, recurring um, events is where there's a, some sort of a time slip has been described as a glitch in time or a time quake being the equivalent of a physical earthquake. And when you're in a... Uh, to say an ancient castle, like the, uh, this is the sort of story that goes with Caerphilly Castle near Cardiff, yeah. where the, the uh, paranormal phenomenon which is most frequently witnessed and described um, by reliable witnesses who are in the area is that the, the green lady of Caerphilly Castle, who is seen looking out over the, uh, over the battlements and wearing a costume of Middle Ages, and this poor lady in history um, had a partner whom she absolutely adored, and he'd gone off to the wars and was killed, and she, not knowing he was dead, kept going to the battlements looking for him, where is my man, where is he, where is he, Mm. and it is her, her spirit, or she would say, this time slip, if the um, the emotion that she felt somehow, and this happens with a number of paranormal phenomena that we've investigated, 
It's as if the emotion in a situation seems somehow to cause either a time slip or another theory is that it is recorded in the stonework, in the fabric. So just as we could record our conversation tonight or the program yeah. deliberately on a, a CD or on a, a tape, then what if certain crystalline structures in the fabric of an ancient building are able to record an event, especially an emotional event? Hmm. And when someone comes along with the correct playback apparatus, that is, somebody comes along who is sensitive to psychic phenomena, somebody we might call a medium, for want of a better word, then he or she can pick up an event that happened 500 years ago mm. and see the recording of it. Yeah. But the, the last of these suggestions in this third chapter of the book about what paranormal phenomena may really be is that there's something mental and that just as if I'm writing a story or if I'm writing a scene for a film, I, as a writer, am creating a character and creating something for that character to do with it in a situation. Now, if we go stage further and think about the work of a film director, then he, talking to his film actors, will tell them what he wants them to do, where he wants them to go, how he wants them to speak the lines. So there is a sense in which he or she, the film director, is creating characters. And what if, uh, according to some theorists of the paranormal, some investigators, the human mind is capable of creating beyond what a writer or film director can create, but is actually creating is visible to other people. There's the, the famous story of the Tibetan tulpa, as they call them, you know, T-U-L-P-A, in which certain lamas are reputed to have the ability to create a character and to make that character so real that other people can see it as well. Mm. I have some questions for you, actually. Um, yes. Going back on a couple of things. Yeah, sure. First of all, the evidence side of it. When it comes to someone's memories, is it a very different thing as every time they remember it changes? Yeah. Um, so what can we take from this? If, is it, uh, if it wasn't written down at the time, because as you notice, sometimes it does change when they tell the story. Oh, yes. So um, how do you work, work through that? Well, when we looked into, as I said, when I did that course for Cambridge yeah. on the psychology and sociology of paranormal phenomena and unsolved mysteries, this is one of the factors that we really must take into account. And you can be the most honest person, the most honest man or woman. And what we tend to remember, and this is, you know, part of the psychological analysis, mm -hmm. is not the event, but the first retelling of the event. Yeah. And I find that extremely interesting. And just as a stage comedian, if he's thinking up some new jokes, will tend to emphasize a particular part of the story, or will um, truncate another part that is less entertaining, and will then remember that joke which he intends to share with his audience but to remember it um, as he has edited it. Yeah. And this is a tendency uh, in all of us to remember, we're trying to be scrupulously honest, mm. but we have to cope with the fact that human memory does that sort of thing, that it behaves in that way, and we've got to make allowance for it. So that I can 
uh, with the best will in the world, try to remember some important event uh, as I was um, describing to you my experience with the uh, reappearance of my dear old friend Billy Thurow. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've done my best, absolutely, because we're talking about the importance of it. Oh, yes. Um, but it may not have been exactly mm. as I recounted it, though yeah. I did my best to make it accurate. Yes. We're all, we're all human. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. we do it. The other question I want to ask, so going back on time slips, funny enough, Dave Lloyd, uh, David Lloyd was wanting to ask, um, what do you think about different timelines? Do you think they exist and overlap from time to time? And for, for, for instance, time slips, do you believe in them? Uh, yes, I think they are. Um, let's just link that, if we can, with the question of the, should we say, malfunction of the human memory. Mm -hmm. It is just remotely possible that we have experienced an event more than once, that we've been on another track, that we've been in and out of another time. Yeah. And so that if I experienced event A, well, let me give you an example from real life where it was a very very intense experience. Patricia and I were investigating the mystery of the money pit on Oak Island, Nova Scotia. And uh, this was a uh, one of the famous world mysteries. And there is a, a shaft over a hundred feet deep in this little island. It's only about a couple of miles long and a mile wide. It's one of over 300 islands in Mahon Bay which is where the Atlantic comes into the coast of Nova Scotia, near Halifax, Nova Scotia. And we needed to hire a boat to take us to a neighboring island where there was supposed to be another mystery shaft, which, according to some of the local traditions, linked up with the base of the Oak Island shaft and there was some sort of mysterious labyrinth connecting two or three of these 300 islands. Mm. So uh, we hired the boat and its uh, captain and builder, and it was um, all, only a small thing, 20, 30 feet long, and a uh, diesel engine. And suddenly the guy who owned it and who was taking us out across to the island the Frog Island was the one we wanted to go to with the other pit. And he suddenly turned as white as a sheet and said, I'm sorry, I've got salt water in the diesel. There's a pipe broken. I've lost the engine. And the boat was pitching at between 45 and 50 degrees. And when you could no longer keep its head to the waves, the chance of it going over was frighteningly real. Now, um... I'm a powerful swimmer. I do 20 miles if I had to. And my Patricia, who is more to me than my own wife, doesn't swim at all. And here we are in Mahone Bay in a pretty well storm situation in a boat which is about to roll over. And I said to her, honey, when this goes over, you just hang on tight to my collar each side. And if I can't get you out, I'm not going. And I'm here to tell the story, so it yeah. had a happy ending. And Andy seven oh seven says, "What a coincidence! He's watching the Curse of Oak Island." Is he? And he's wondering whether you've actually seen it. Uh, uh, yes, I, I've seen the show. Yes. <laughs> well, that is amazing. So. Um, because we were there a long time ago. We've written two books on it, as well as making a program on it. Mm. And, uh, yeah, it was a, a very, very strange place. And the, um, but the, uh, what I was thinking of then especially was in the intensity of the situation. Now, we're looking at time slips. And when I tell the story again, as I did to you and our listeners just now, yeah. what I wonder is, did it only happen to me once? 
or because it's so vivid in my memory mm -hmm. that, as I said, my lovely lady who is the center of my life, and I, I just couldn't live without her. Oh, yes. um, if, uh, you know, in a situation like that where the thing that matters to you more than your own life is in danger, then the intensity of your emotions, you do rather wonder whether, is it some sort of deja vu? Have I done mm. it before? Have I seen it before? And it's almost as if on one probability track or on one time slip, maybe we didn't get out. And in another, in that other probability track, uh, 20 years ago, we both died in the Atlantic, just off Nova Scotia. <laughs> um, in which case, how different life would have been. Yeah. Our grandchildren would have had no grandparents. Um, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, we wouldn't have been there to endure their company. Yeah. Right, bear with me. This is a bit of a long-winded question. Okay, I'll do my best. Okay, if we are saying that it is ourself or soul that moves on, where would you say it resides? The Egyptians once believed that it was in the heart. Nowadays, they say the brain. But why not the solar plexus? After all, it is that that feels that familiar pull when something is about to go right or wrong. Okay. Well, I think in order to do my best to suggest an answer, mm -hmm. I would need to think about something mysterious like electricity. Okay. Now, an electric current is a movement of electrons through a substance which can conduct them, in other words, which can allow them to move. Mm -hmm. If you apply voltage to such a substance, let's say a copper wire, and you're putting either a battery up against it or you're putting a small generator on it, like a little bicycle dynamo, now, once that is in position, the electricity moves. But when we say an electric current moves, all that is happening, and this is what makes electricity so amazingly mysterious, is that you, so you kind of tap it on one end, and electrons move around it. If you could imagine a group of us standing in a line, and... Nothing is happening at the moment, mm. but somebody comes along, and we've we've decided to, as it were, practice and rehearse this in order to increase our understanding of electricity. Yeah. Somebody comes along and taps the person at the back of the queue on the shoulder. That person then taps the person in front of him, who taps the person in front of her, who taps, and so on, so that. Instead of a moving electron, you've got a movement of a physical hand onto the shoulder of the person in front. And eventually, let's say that there's a hundred people in the line, which is representing our copper wire. Yeah. At the far end is a machine which needs to be started. And the man, the hundredth man in the line, once he's been tapped on the shoulder, his hand comes down and hits the starter of the machine. Right. So the electric current is the tapping on the shoulder. The electric current in the real world, in the real wire, mm -hmm. is the movement of the first electron to the second. It, it, it bumps into the next atom, as it were, yeah. which then chucks out another electron. Okay. Now, if we think about that, and then go back to this very important and interesting question, what is life? What is life energy? It's something I would suggest, like electricity, so that the soul or the spirit is an activity within us, because I don't believe, we looked at those, those excellent examples of the Egyptian belief that it was in the heart and modern neurology telling us that it's in the brain and yeah. a series of synapses between brain cells. But if we compare it with electricity, 
We could always say, well, electricity isn't anything. It's a line of people standing motionless until pressure hits the one at the back and makes him or her do something. Mm. Now, if we separate, and um, when I do a little bit of science teaching, I, I, I try hard to, to do this in physics. If we, if we separate the idea of energy from the idea of solid matter, so the physical body, the heart, the brain, the liver, the lungs, the kidneys, those are all physical matter. But the life process is energy. And in the same way, if we take our most up-to-date thoughts about the existence of the soul or spirit, the psyche, inside the brain as a system of moving uh, current through the new, uh, through the, uh, the neurons, mm -hmm. then it is totally separate from it. If we took a, a, another factual example, here are you and I on the other end of a telephone, or you know, with electronic speaking equipment, yeah. and what is happening? You are having interesting thoughts. Our listeners are having interesting thoughts. I'm doing my best as a question is raised mm -hmm. to think about it and try to give it the answer it deserves. And at the same time, the thinking process is not my hand on the telephone no. or my ear against the telephone, <laughs> but it's something in the listener's mind as he or she phrases a question. Yes. Something in your mind as you relay the question for me, and something in my mind, so that I see the the human spirit, the human soul, the human psyche as a an entity which is pure energy, which is why it's immortal, mm. because energy can only be changed; it can't be destroyed. Yeah. Does that help? Yeah, that's fine. Uh, now, in your book, you write about ghosts. Do you think we see them because we cannot connect physically? Was that psychically? Psychically, sorry. Right, because <laughs> we, we see them because we cannot connect with psychically. Yeah. Well, one of the one of the ways I'd approach that uh, question uh, is to suggest that. All of our physical senses, and they in turn bring information to the real us, the real character, the real personality, the the psyche, the you know the, the real soul, spirit, or character. Yeah. Um, that we learn about the environment through our hearing, through our sight, through what we touch, what we taste, what we smell, through all these. Uh, all these sense organs bring us information about the outside world. Now, when we encounter difficulties with seeing, with hearing, um, if I'm going to read small print, I need my glasses. If I'm going to talk to a friend at a distance, I need a telephone. And uh, in the same way, if I'm going to enjoy my fish and chips, I like to put some tomato sauce on the chips to intensify my gustatory sensations. Now, just as our physical senses vary, uh, someone who's a professional wine taster mm -hmm. will have a magnificent sense of taste. A perfumier will have a wonderful mm -hmm. sense. Uh, of smell. Yeah. Can you just hold on a second, please? Sure. Please? I've just lost the connection for some reason. So bear with me. We'll get back on in two seconds. Right. Okay. Carry on. <laughs> okay. Now, so that just as we know, shall we say, that a chef has a wonderful sense of taste, that a perfumier has a wonderful sense of smell, a musician will normally have a very fine hearing, um, a uh, an Olympic marksman who is going to put every bullet through the bullseye and will have exceptionally keen vision. There are others 
who, as I said, I have to put my glasses on to read small print. Yeah. And I have to turn up my radio quite loudly um, if I want to be sure I can hear it when I'm in the car and there's an end <laughs> noise as well. Yeah. Now, so some of us have got brilliantly acute senses. Others have to augment the senses. Okay. Now, this, I believe, can be used as a parallel for understanding psychic senses. I go to places where honest witnesses tell me that they have seen or heard or even touched in a, a poltergeist situation where they've actually felt objects moving physically, that it's a tactile sensation. And others who are in that same situation feel nothing. When in the story I told you about my friend Billy Farrow, yeah. Father Ian, the other priest, could neither see him nor hear him. No. And yet to me, he was as clear as if he was alive again and standing beside me in the room. Now, when we come to the core of this very interesting question, about why do some people see ghosts and others don't, that, they, um, that there's a, a difference in our psychic perceptions. Mm -hmm. There's a, a difference in psychic per perception. And I'm quite sure that over the years when people have brought information to you, they will have mentioned that a certain pet dog yeah. appears to be able to see or hear something which a human being can't. Yeah. And there are those wonderful accounts of a horse that has stopped despite all the urgings of the rider. And when the rider gets off to investigate, there just around the corner, unseen, um, a fence has blown down and there's dangerous barbed wire right across the track, which would nearly have killed the rider had the horse ridden him through it. Mm. Now, there is a certain, I think, additional perceptivity in certain sensitive animals, and that also extends throughout human beings like us. And when I was asked to go over to the Odeon Cinema to perform an exorcism, which is a bit unusual in a cinema, one of the young uh, ushers there had given up his job because he felt that the place was so evil and dangerous that there was some sort of dark, negative, hostile spirit force that was making life unbearable for him. Now, his manager, an extremely nice bloke, very caring, very sympathetic, had arranged for me to go over to perform an exorcism in the area where this young man who had been an usher mm. had been frightened out of his job. I took with me a, a lady named Brenda Howells who was the most sensitive medium I've ever met in the course of 50 years exploration. Absolutely brilliant. Highly educated as well. She was a qualified midwife and she also had a law degree so that she had great nursing skill in the medical side of her work and uh, was also very academic. And she came with me to the cinema. The minute we got inside, I felt absolutely nothing at all. Yeah. But Brenda said, there is something very sinister in here. When we reached the point in the corridor where the young usher had been so frightened and so upset. Bremna said, I can see them, they are attacking him, and the only way I can describe them is to say that they are like psychic piranha fish. Mm. I then spread, the, the boy was collapsing against the wall and holding his stomach and saying, they are hurting me. I sprinkled him with holy water and used one of the prayers of exorcism. Bremna said, they are terrified of the holy water. They are going, they're streaking off down the corridor. Now, 
The young fellow then got up and said, Father, they've gone. They're not hurting me now. And Bremner said, yes, they're out of sight. Now, I saw, I heard nothing. Mm. I simply went through the um, exorcism process and I had to rely on what my medium friend, who was, I said, hypersensitive to these things, and the young man who claimed he was being attacked by them, they were both aware of them in a way that I was not. And it's very, very strange that over the, the, the last few years when I've been asked to go and perform exorcisms, I neither see nor hear nor feel anything. But if there is a sensitive medium or someone who has been frightened by whatever paranormal thing I have been called into exorcise, yeah. they will tell me, yes, Father, it's better. I always say to them, look, if you have any more trouble, please call me again and I'll come and deal with it again for you. And I don't know whether we call it some sort of psychic talent, but <laughs> or some sort of psychic <laughs> gift, but I would appear to be a psychic warrior rather than a psychic perceiver. Right, okay. And uh, uh, anyway, that's going, you know, around is that I think that we all have different levels of yeah. perception. Okay. And that's what I think is the best answer to that question. Right. We've got a couple of more questions. I hope we're okay for time with you. Um, yes, I'm okay. Uh, about another ten minutes or yeah, so? Yeah, that's fine. Would that be okay for yeah. you? Um, we've got a question about reincarnation. What are your thoughts about this? Whoa, yes. Oh, yes, please. No. <laughs> Um, reincarnation I find totally fascinating and uh, I am so interested in it that uh, I have experimented with hypnoregression and some very very strange things have come out in the earliest of my memories if it was a previous life and if it wasn't just something that's you know occurring as part of the human mind and its creativity and its imagination. But uh, I was a sailor oh, probably 3,000 years ago mm. on a Greek cargo vessel. Mm. And what I found so odd was that the skipper was telling us we were carrying big, you know those big Greek urns? Yeah. The, uh, um, the ones that are um, sort of um, like earthenware or made of clay. Yeah. But I was down in the hold with two or three other crew members and we had a load of straw and hay down there. And the ship's master, the skipper, was shouting down to us to make sure that we put handfuls of straw and hay between all these vessels. There were some filled with wine and some filled with olive oil, both of which were expensive commodities then as they are now. And I would never in a thousand years have guessed that one of the important procedures when you are packing an old Greek merchant ship with expensive liquid in stone jars that you put straw in between them mm. so that they don't. In other words, what I found so odd about that apparent reincarnation memory was that when I'd been a crewman on this um, merchant vessel, yeah. that one of the most important things we had to do was to put the hay and straw between the, the clay vessels to stop them smashing each other in a storm. Yeah. And... I would never consciously have thought of that. If I'd been asked to write a book about an old Greek sailing ship, I'd have had the jars against each other and probably breaking with the waves. <laughs> so, so you do believe in reincarnation then? Well, I think it may be there. Uh, I honestly don't know. Right. And uh, on another, I think that from my own hypno-regressive experiences, mm -hmm. I think that it was more than imagination. Yeah. But whether it was a memory of a previous life, 
I wouldn't be certain, uh, because I had several other quite vivid ones. In a, in another, I was at the, the Battle of Waterloo, and I was at um, a, a very a, a very simple um, infantryman with a, a muzzle-loading gun. <laughs> it was extremely difficult to load and fire. And I remember thinking, if I don't get this blessed thing to work, I'm going to be killed when they come charging at us. I'd better make it work. Oh, and yeah. it's that intensity. And what I think leads me to believe in the possibility of reincarnation yeah. is that attention to detail, which you would really remember had you lived through it, mm. as opposed to what you would make up you see, I, I'm taking yeah. my life as a writer yeah. with my life, with my hypno regression experiences, okay. and details come out in the hypno regression mm. which you don't use as a writer who is imagining things. Right. You don't hit the detail no. in the same depth. This is it. Now, Chris Mack would like to know what scares you the most and why. Wow. Well, I shall have to be, I shall have to be incredibly careful as to how I answer. <laughs> because um, I want to tell the simple truth and be totally factual, mm. and at the same time, I don't want to sound arrogant, right? Which I would hate to do. Yeah. But I try very hard not to be. But I'm a third Dan martial arts instructor, mm -hmm. and I think that goes some of the way. I took the East of England silver medal a few years. And uh, on a, another occasion, when I was headmastering, I came into the schoolyard one morning and our students were aged from 11 to 18. Yeah. And there was one of the local drug dealers was going around the, the teenage girls in the schoolyard, giving them free samples. Oh, but you don't know where that leads to. Yeah. So I go up to this object and tell him in no uncertain terms to get out and never come back to my school. And because I was dressed as a teacher, you know, suit and a collar and tie, mm -hmm. and he was dressed up in his leathers and his roll neck, and he looked as if he thought he was one of the local hard men. Yeah. When I told him to go, he spat at me. And that is not a very clever thing to do to a bloke who's a third Dan martial arts instructor. No. Um, anyway... Within 30 seconds, he was whimpering, injured, and crawling away. <laughs> and my parting shot to him was, if you ever spit at me again, Sonny, it'll be your teeth. <laughs> and uh, in the 11 or 12 years I was there, we never had any more trouble from him. But um, if I look basically physically, uh, again, I'm, uh, I'm not a, a afraid. I'm... Another occasion, Patricia and I were in a, a street in Cardiff, not as the Hayes, where one or two homeless people tend to sleep rough. Mm. And there was a big fella, 6'2", 6'3", and probably 17 stone. And he got he was one of the homeless and a real rough-looking object. And he got a poor little teenage girl by one wrist, and he was obviously pimping the poor kid. And he was snarling at her, and when I get you a client, you do as you're so and so told. And okay. so, I, I think he actually meant paranormal, though. Well, uh, right, okay. <laughs> but uh, you can guess what happened to him. Yeah. <laughs> so I said, physically, uh, let, let's look into the paranormal. No, I can also say, and I say, I, I hate to find arrogant, but mm. I'm not afraid of anything that I'm aware of. I mean, I've been into... Some of the strangest places on earth, you know, the tomb uh, in Barbados where the coffins moved on their own, um, the Oak Island money pit, been down to Red Plateau and all the odd things yeah. in there. And I can truthfully say, maybe I'm too stupid to be afraid. <laughs> oh dear. And the last thing I <laughs> want to mention to you is <laughs> okay. I, like, I like your new word, ubies and ubiness. When it comes to... Out of body experience. Yes. Yeah, oobies. Yeah. Beware of the oobies. The oobies. <laughs> Have you encountered any out of body experiences? Well, the, the most interesting one um, 
was a wonderful chap, who's a great friend of ours to this day, and uh, first met him 20 years ago. His name is David Eberson. Yeah. And David um, had been very, very seriously ill um, with cancer when he was only a young man in his 20s. Mm. And he was in a small, single-bed ward and was not expected to live more than two or three days. Right. The consultant came in and to his, with some students, and to his amazement, David was out of bed for the first time in three days. He got his Walkman on his ears, was hanging on to the foot of the bed so he didn't fall over, and was so happy he was trying to dance to the music on the Walkman. And consultant was amazed. He said, David, you're in remission. I can't believe it. It's wonderful. And uh, then David explained what had happened. Mm. He had been at his lowest, and death had not seemed very far away. He had had an out-of-the-body experience, going down the long, dark tunnel to the light at the end of the tunnel, which he described to me and to his consultant as being like uh, a carousel, a roundabout at a fun fair with light and color and music. And people on this carousel were so incredibly happy. They were waving and smiling, laughing. And he wanted to get on more than anything else in his life up to that moment. He wanted to get on the carousel with them. Mm. And they waved him back and said, No, David, we came to tell you that you have many more years on earth. You're going to get well. Then he went back down the tunnel. The light went out, and he got out of bed, and he hadn't had his walkman on for days. He felt so ill. And then when the consultant came in, the remission had started. Mm-hmm. And uh, he is now a very happy manager of uh, Gents Outfitters, which is what he always wanted to do. Okay. Oh. So that was an amazing booby. Right. And just the last quick question here. Um, Andy would like to know, did you actually go get into the money pit? Uh, Now, the money pit, Oak Island, I was with Dan Blankenship, who, if she's seen the program, she will know, was the guy who's been working on there for over 40 years Mm -hmm. and who drilled another shaft close to the money pit, which was called Borehole 10X. Now, the money pit itself was inaccessible unless you've got your diving kit with you because it's flooded to within a few feet of the top and Borehole 10X is also flooded now. That was the one that Dan Blankenship built. So it's not really possible unless you're in diving kit, which I didn't have with me. I'd have been more than happy to go down. (laughs) Um, But I've stood on the edge of it and looked into it and I've stood on the edge of Borehole 10X that Dan built and looked down there. And Patricia and I have walked together on the artificial beach where the flood tunnels came in which booby-trapped the money pit. So I've been as close as it was possible to get. Right, okay. So that answers these questions. Thank you very much, Lionel. It's been great having you back on again. It's been lovely to be on your show, and I think you're doing a tremendous job. Thank I really you. That really makes, makes me feel good. Thank you very much. Um, wish you, you and your good wife a very good year. Hopefully it's uh, all good for you. Yep. Okay. I should be. Uh, the next thing I'm looking forward to is in uh, February the 9th is my 80th birthday. So we're going to have a good time. <laughs> you do that. So, well, thanks again, my love, and take God care. God bless you all. Bye-bye. Bye now. So until next time, remember, keep, keep the, the paranormal, paranormal friendly. friendly. Good night and God bless. Good night.